Many of us here were familiar with Eldon. If you were not, he was a big guy with a big heart that was kind of the epitome of simultaneously being saint and sinner, as all of us are. He knew just how to press one's buttons and drive one batty. Sometimes he would make a big mess. But then other times I would catch him sweeping up leaves in front of the church door without anyone having asked him. Or to help load the church bell onto a truck for the country fair parade. More than once, I needed to remind him that there was not alcohol allowed on church property, and I poured his beer out in front of him. He would get mad, but as he left, he said, I love you, Pastor. Elvin liked to call Calvary his home. He felt safe on the steps in front of the social hall and sleeping behind the church building. He was loud. He would yell to himself many times. Even when he slept, he would yell in his sleep. I had one neighbor concerned that maybe there was a fight going on, but it was just Eldon dreaming. As inappropriate as he could be at times, he wasn't violent. His biggest fight was with his addictions that kept him on the street. Ellen was aware of the fact that he often didn't smell good, and his teeth were missing. They were lost or stolen. And he didn't dress so dapper. Some days he cared. Many days he didn't. But what he did always care about was Jesus Christ. I'm not sure how many of you know this about him, but he was passionate about his faith. I can't tell you how many times he asked me to pray with him or for him. And on some of his more sober days, he would come and worship with us, and there would be tears in his eyes when he was offered the body of Christ given for him. Ellen told me that he wished that he could be a pastor or a preacher. But since that didn't seem to be something that was likely to happen, he was always excited when he would get these paper tracts about Jesus so that he could hand them out to share the good news. A few weeks ago, at his memorial service, we learned that Eldon had been waiting to get into a program. And as he was waiting, he decided that he was going to be the self-appointed Billy Graham of Friendship Park. That he was going to share the difference that Jesus made in his life with other individuals who were also homeless. And I sort of wonder what the reaction might have been from people as they saw this tall, dirty, wild-eyed, wild-haired man <coughs> coming at them to tell them to get ready for Jesus in your life. <clears throat> I suppose it might not have been all that different than the reaction of the people who lived in the region around the Jordan when John the baptizer came to them under similar circumstances. In Luke's Gospel this morning, Luke gives us context by listing off a number of 
political world leaders, and church leaders. And then concludes by including John. This is a bit surprising because one of these is not like the others. Although the political leaders and church leaders had power and status, and, and then there's John, who, while well, he was Zechariah's son and Jesus' cousin, he lived as a recluse out in the wilderness. I mean, the guy ate bugs and honey, and he wore this ever so soft, not camel's hair. I, I'm sure he was quite a sight to behold, one that did not fit in with the crowd who he was preaching at or to. By Luke giving us the setting, it would be almost as if we heard in the second year when Donald Trump was president and Jerry Brown was governor of California and Daryl Steinberg was mayor of Sacramento and Elizabeth Eden is presiding bishop of the ELCA and Mark Holmrood is the bishop of the Sierra Pacific Synod. The word of God came to Eldon on the streets of Rio Linda. <laughs> It gives a whole different perspective, doesn't it? it? It really does. But the thing is, the people listened to John. They listened as he called to them to repent for the forgiveness of sins, to stop living their lives just centered on themselves and to make their path straight in getting ready for the Messiah in their lives. And they did repent. And they were baptized. And I'm guessing they worked pretty hard to make their path straight. I'm pretty sure that Luke's audience, who were a good 50 to 60 years after the time of these events, might have been familiar with some of these names, like Emperor Tiberius or Caiaphas. <laughs> or Pontius Pilate, or Herod. But the name that they were paying the most attention to was that of this wandering, wild preacher, John. Likewise, 2,000 years later, John the Baptizer, John the Baptist, is probably the name that we are most familiar with. Few of us know anything about Emperor Tiberius or Caiaphas. As Luke is writing his gospel, he's making a point that the subject of this report is not any of those world leaders any of those church leaders. It's not even John. But it's the Word of God. The Word of God is what it's all about. The Word of God that announces to us this good news of God's unconditional grace and forgiveness. That God chose to come and become one of us to show us what God's love looks like. And Luke is making a claim that God so often chooses to send God's word to be proclaimed by the most unlikely of candidates. It would have made so much more sense to most of us if God's word had been sent to be proclaimed by the high priest Caiaphas. But instead, God chose to use those who others of us might deem insignificant, unworthy, useless, not worth our time. So often throughout Scripture, God uses 
fishermen, shepherds, women, and those like John who lived on the fringe of society. We know that God even used Elvin. We don't know the effects of Elvin's ministry, but I'm sure God does. And we know that God uses you and me. This Advent, we wait to encounter the Word of God. We anticipate leaning into the light of Christ. And we wonder at this new life with forgiveness and hope and joy and love and peace. And as we wait, we prepare our hearts, making our paths straight, and we open our eyes and we begin to see Jesus in all the John the baptizers who we might encounter. And we see Jesus in one another. And the more we see Jesus, the more we draw near into the kingdom of heaven. For Christ is already, but not yet, in our midst. Amen. Amen.